بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so let us now resume from where uh, we had left off in the story of Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an and uh, I had basically mentioned the pre uh, caliphate stories of Ali now we get on to the khilafa and today we will talk about one of the saddest incidents in our uh, Islamic history and we'll continue the story next Wednesday inshallah ta'ala so Uthman radiallahu an was massacred on a Friday as we had said and the same day uh, the mobs, many of them had left the city, uh, many of them had gone back to their lands, Iraq and, and uh, Egypt, primarily these were the two places they were from, and many of them remained outside of the uh, city. And immediately on the same day, Friday, talk began who would become the next Khalifa. It was chaotic, obviously uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu had just been killed, massacred, and so people began to ask themselves who would be the next Khalifa. They went to a number of the prominent Sahaba. They went to people like Abdullah ibn Umar and they said to him your father was the Khalifa you were the one appointed in charge of the uh, Shura at the death of your father so why don't you take charge of the Khilafah and Ibn Umar radiallahu an was always a very quietist very low-key apolitical figure his whole life he was just a worshipper and a Zahid. He never liked politics and he really didn't get involved at all in politics. So he said, La hajata li fi dhalik, which is the Arabic expression, I don't want this at all. Right? I have no concern in this. Don't, don't even think about me. So they went to other senior members of the Sahaba. And of the Shura, there were still members alive. Sa'd ibn Abi Baqas was alive, Talha was alive, Zubayr were alive. These were all alive from the time of Umar ibn Khattab Shura. And they were all approached and all of them said, I am not interested, don't even think about it, you know, especially now the chaos has happened and whatnot. And as for Ali ibn Abi Talib, he had on the day of Friday when he heard of the massacre, uh, he had gone back to his house and locked himself in because he did not want any responsibility. He was worried what was going to happen, which is basically people are going to come to him. So he did not come outside for the whole day. The next day the people came and they started knocking on his door. And they, a crowd gathered outside his door and they kept on knocking, knocking, knocking until finally when they were let in, uh, they said that this matter, this affair of ours needs a leader. And there's nobody that we can trust other than you. There's nobody that we can trust other than you. And his first reaction was that Find any other man that you guys approve of. And these are the people of Medina, the A'yan, they called. Uh, be, these are basically the nobles of the city, the people that are involved. You know, every community has four, five, six, ten people that are the most active. So the, the, the nobles of the city, they come to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali says, go find anybody whom you like and I will give him my oath of allegiance. And you shall find me the most noble helper to the Amir. I'll be the minister, I'll be whatever you want. Go find somebody else. But they said, no, we were not going to be happy with anybody other than you. And they mentioned all of his blessings. You are the uh, son-in-law of the Prophet, you are of the Shura, you are this. And all of this is mentioned. So Ali ibn Abi Talib said, if this is the way you feel, then this bay'ah, this oath has to occur in public, not in my house. This isn't some type of secret gathering. It has to be done and everybody sees and then if there's any issues or whatnot, it can be dealt with. And so they took him to the masjid against the uh, wishes of some of the Sahaba who said maybe the, uh, the, the rebels are still there, the, uh, the, the chaos is still there. But Ali radiallahu insisted this cannot take place in private in my house. It has to be done in front of all of the uh, people. There can be no bay'ah in secret, he would say. Right? And by the way, pause here, footnote. So subhanAllah, look at this modern day pseudo-caliph. Uh, the Baghdadi guy, huh? And this is exactly what he is doing. Who put him in charge? Who? This is exactly. Ali radiallahu anhu said, "I am not going to take bay'ah in a secret room with ten people. That's not how a khilafah is done. People, the ummah has to approve. There has to be a shura. You can't just, you know, come over and take over like this." So this is the fiqh of Ali radiallahu anhu. If only these modern, you know, pseudo followers would understand. So. He goes, he goes to the masjid and uh, it is announced that we have chosen Ali radiallahu an. So everybody should come and give him the uh, bay'ah. And uh, eventually all of the sahaba gave, uh, in Medina gave bay'ah to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now there are some reports. Now here's where we get 
um, I'm not going to go advanced, I'm not going to go into all these zirat, but you should know that these, this era in particular has absolutely contradictory reports, contradictory reports. This era in particular is full of narrations that are biased from all sides, and there's not just two sides by the way, there's not just two sides, there's multiple if you like, uh, uh, you know, um, biases that exist, and it is very difficult, if not impossible, to navigate through. In any case, for this level, inshallah, I'm going to give a very cursory, very, uh, very, uh, inshallah, easygoing analysis, and we're not going to go too deep. Just realize that other non-Sunni sources, they claim that Talha and Zubair did not give the oath of allegiance, that they always, astaghfirullah, hated Ali. Understand that Talha and Zubair, they are from our Ashara, correct? But from the other side, they are not even Muslim, you understand? Yeah, you need the non-Sunni group. They really do not view these two as positive. In fact, they are astaghfirullah. Some of them consider them a'udhu billah kafir because they fought against Ali, as we're going to talk about. But from our sources in Sahih Bukhari and the most authentic sources, Talha and Zubair, they eventually did give the oath of allegiance. It is perhaps true that they said, we will not give you the oath until the people have given. Meaning, it's not going to be a private matter that 10 people agree to. That we all have to agree and we're not just going to give you until there's consensus. But in our sources, Talha and Zubayr radiallahu anhum, they gave bay'ah publicly to Ali in the, uh, on the member of the Prophet ﷺ in the masjid. So this is something that we do not doubt whatever the other group says that is their, that is their business and their uh, sources. Now, this is when... So Ali radiallahu anhu, basically the matter became clear that he is the uh, Khalifa. This is when the divisions began for the very first time. And uh, once again, the problem comes, the reports are very, very sparse and they are contradictory. And there's a million and one questions in the minds of every one of us, even myself, every time I read these reports, some thought comes, why didn't he do this? Why didn't he say this? Why didn't he do that? And in the end of the day, we have to proceed from now on with the assumption that the Sahaba were there and we weren't there and we trust their judgment and they know what we do not know and they saw what we cannot see and they assess the situation that we are ignorant of. So we have to have a husnadhan, a positive attitude that they did what is best even if we don't fully understand because honestly, every time I talk about this, or even when I myself read it, it's difficult not to question, why didn't Talha do this? Why didn't Ali do this? Why didn't Aisha do that? And it's so easy, 14 centuries later, to double guess. But we were not there, and each one, that's what our position is, as I said a million and one times, we are agreed upon this in Sunni Islam. Astaghfirullah, none of them wanted to harm the Ummah or Islam. That's honestly, wallahi, it is illogical even to think this, in light of their track record. It is illogical and it is against our aqidah, our theology to think this. Obviously the non-Sunni groups, they don't have this theology. They don't care if astaghfirullah, they talk about the niyyah of Talha and Zubair and Aisha, so they can go whatever they want in their imagination. But for us, it is very clear that their track records, Talha and Zubair radiallahu anhum, are of the first converts from Mecca. They have participated in, and we're going to talk about their biographies in a few weeks, inshallah. They have participated in almost every single uh, battle. And the Prophet sallallahu uh, a hadith for them with mutawatira. He said, Zubair is my hawari, he is my hawari, he is my disciple, right? And Talha was the one that uh, was the primary defender at the battle of Uhud. The battle of Uhud, his right hand, his right hand was paralyzed because of Uhud, because of his wounds at Uhud. He could not raise his hand up. And by the way, even when he gave bay'ah to Ali, he had to pick up his right hand and put it because his right hand was paralyzed. Because his body, remember what he did, was defending the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi You're going to doubt him? I mean, honestly, wallah, even just common sense, forget Quran and Sunnah theology, the Sunni Islam, even common sense and tr track record, you're now going to assume that astaghfirullah, they had some bizarre ideas about the ummah. So we don't believe this. We're not going to, you know, even in my whole talk, I'm not going to even discuss their version of events. We're not going to discuss it because honestly, honestly, and I, I'm not somebody who is very crude or whatnot, but it is so fanciful. It is so imaginative that really it's not even worth a dignified response. Just let them, let them uh, say what they're saying and Allah will deal with them. For us, it is very clear what, uh, what we believe. Uh, nonetheless, questions do arise and we have to then say they knew best, 
what they um, what they thought was the best way to proceed. So what was the first tension? The first tension that's ar uh, arisen is very simple. There are still a few thousand of the mobs that had come, remember a few, uh, uh, maybe 6,000 people had come uh, to protest against Uthman all the months, remember, that had taken place. They had come from all around after the Hajj. So there's still a few thousand of them. Now, the question arises, now these thousands did not actually kill Uthman. The actual killers of Uthman disappeared into the crowd. And to this day, we do not know their names. To this day, we do not know the names. Because the actual 5-10 people who literally unsheathed the sword and did the deed in the house, we really don't know. They, were, they just literally did it and then they fled into these thousands. Now definitely, maybe 30, 40, 50 knew who the 5 were. And maybe another 200 knew the 30 who knew the 5. You know how it goes. You know how it goes in these types of gatherings. So the question arises, what is to be done with these 5,000 people, angry mob, that is still in Medina? And this is where the tensions arose. That Ali radiallahu an thought that if he were to start fighting these 5,000 people, and the fact of the matter is that the bulk of them do not have Uthman's blood on their hands, what was their crime? to be a part of the crowd who protested Uthman radiallahu anhu. They didn't actually storm the house, they didn't actually unsheathe the sword, but they are, the Arabic term is ghawgha, they are the mobs. This is what the, Arab, Arab, the classical Arabic term, the ghawgha is just, they're the mobs. They were still there. So Ali radiallahu anhu thought that if he were to fight them, he himself does not have those troops right now, number one. Number two, Islam has not yet seen the civil war. Never has a sword been unsheathed against another Muslim. Remember this, right? Never has actually two, ba two Muslim armies fought together, right? And number three, there are interpretations as well that uh, the emperor of Constantinople, the Roman emperor, was monitoring this and he was thinking of launching an attack if the Muslims are engaged in civil war. There's talk like this as well in some of the books. And so, for whatever reason, Ali radiallahu an decided that it's just not wise to take on these thousands of people right now. It's going to cause more chaos and damage in the long run. And by the way, I mean, yani even in modern times, by the way, it's very common after a massacre or a civil war, the government says, okay, amnesty for all because we can't go back and and figure out who did what, then everybody is going to be guilty of something. So we, I just came back from South Africa. And you know in South Africa, there was some brutal, brutal apartheid for 50, 60 years. There were massacres, there were riots, there were secret police doing this and killing people and imprisoning whatnot. When Nelson Mandela came to power, one of the things that he did in 1994, he established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? And this was a very wise step that he made it basically uh, the, the rule of law that if you came and you confessed your crime and you documented it, essentially you'll be forgiven. Why? Because if he were to start jailing everybody who participated in the government, because this is now, you know, the, it was legal, like in Nazi Germany as well, the Nuremberg trials and whatnot, it was legal to do what they were doing in apartheid. If he were to go after every policeman, every this, every that, I mean, it would have caused a type of riot and backlash that fragile South Africa would have been eliminated, right? And so at the time, he was roundly criticized, Nelson Mandela, he was roundly criticized. But in hindsight, it really was the act of a true leader because he even forgave his own captors, you know this. Nelson Mandela forgave the very people who signed his, you know, whatever, torture and, and, and uh, imprisonment or whatever. He forgave some of them and he actually met with some of them. This is on YouTube video and whatnot. So, in hindsight, we see this was a true leader, that in order to heal the wounds of South Africa, he had to move on. Now, if this is a modern example that we all understand, right? Then, wallahi, I trust Ali radiallahu anhu a million times more than Nelson Mandela. I trust the fiqh of Ali and the long sight of Ali radiallahu anhu a million times more than any other uh, uh, person. So, maybe he saw some maslaha, that you know what? All of these thousands of people, their crime is guilt by association. And I can't charge them for that crime. I can't fight them for that crime. So I'll just have to basically move on and consolidate the ummah and see what I can. That was his, that was his uh, niya. Now obviously this did not sit well with many of the senior sahaba, many of them.
not just the one you mentioned, even much more senior than him. And the most senior Sahaba in Medina were Talha and Zubair. These were the most senior. So within a week or so, they visited Ali radiallahu an, and they said that, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, an al waqt it is now time to deal with the Qatalat al-Uthman, to deal with the people who killed Uthman. So Ali radiallahu an said, I, I've just come, just right now, I just got into the office right now, give me some time. Give me some time, I cannot do anything right now. So they gave him some time, they came again, they said, okay, now it is time. And after a few weeks, weeks turned into months, Ali radiallahu anhu basically told them that, my dear brothers, ya ikhwata, my dear brothers, I'm not ignoring this matter, but what can I do against a people who possess more power than we do? and who have support amongst the Mawali and the Arab. So the people who had complained against Uthman, see this is the reality of the world, the world, not just in the t that time, even in our time. It is very easy to rile up the masses. It's very easy to confuse the people. It's very easy when you become vulgar and coarse, like let's say Donald Trump, you can wet up people's appetite and make them anger than they should be, right? And the intelligent, sane politicians don't do that. So their popularity is not that much because only intelligent people, you know, and I give you the example again of American politics, look at some of the more intelligent politicians, look at Bernie Sanders that we just like, I mean, you, at whatever you want to say, at least he's much more intelligent than any of the other candidates. But he's not popular. He cannot be popular. Why? Because it's, what is he going to rile up against, right? He's not, he doesn't have that enemy, the type that Trump does, right? So these ghawgha, these mobs, they whetted up the people's appetite and they're making complaints against complaints so they had attracted even larger following. So Ali radiallahu said, if I attack them, I become the enemies of even more people than these 5,000 because they have mass support. So he said, what do you expect me to do? And as for the Qatala of Uthman themselves, the actual people, find me who they are, get the witnesses, and I'll be the first to do it. So Ali radiallahu anhu is not talking about the actual murderers. Of course, everybody's in agreement that the actual murderers should be executed. But who knows who they are? We still don't know to this day. Who knows where they went and disappeared? They're just, again, they went into their hiding and whatnot. And so this tension continued to increase that the inactivity of Ali radiallahu anhu for a wisdom that he saw became a cause of frustration, human nature, amongst other of the Sahaba who loved Uthman radiallahu anhu. And everybody loved Uthman. Ali loved Uthman, we mentioned. But they felt that Ali radiallahu anhu was not doing enough. And as the months, uh, as the weeks turned into months, four months went by. And Aisha and some of the other mothers of the believers were still in Mecca. Why were they in Mecca? Remember, Uthman had given them permission to perform Hajj. After many, many years, they had actually gone for Hajj. So all of them had gone for Hajj. Then the siege begins, so they stay. Then the news comes of Uthman's death, so they stay. Because obviously, these are the mothers of the believers. They're not gonna, it is not even befitting that they walk into this chaos. Their protection is of paramount importance. The highest priority of the Ummah is to protect our mothers. How can they walk back to this, this chaos situation in Medina? So they're waiting in Mecca for things to stabilize. So Aisha radiallahu anha is in Mecca. She is in Mecca. And Talha and Zubair then leave Medina and go to Mecca. Uh, the, 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 the ostensibly to perform Umrah. Maybe even to talk to Aisha. Uh, and this is when... Uh, they began to discuss what can be done, that this inactivity is simply not acceptable in their eyes. And the Qatalat Uthman, the, the, the notion was, or the statement was, they're still wandering free amongst us, they're walking the streets untouched. How can we allow the blood of Uthman to be so cheap? And it became basically the call for the Dam Uthman to be avenged, right? Islamically avenged. How can the blood of Uthman not be avenged? And again, Ali radiallahu it's not as if he doesn't want to, but the question is, again, how? So that, the, as they say, the devil is in the details. Each one wants the same, but the question is how to uh, get there. And so the discussion began that what is to be done, and for reasons that are still being debated, we're still trying to wonder why, the three of them, meaning Aisha and Talha and Zubair, very senior, all of them, radiallahu anhum, they decided to march to Basra. Now, why? Again, people have differed. One theory, one interpretation, which we find in the classical books, is that some of the senior Sahaba and military commanders were in Basra. 
So they thought that if they went to Basra, they could get military support, which Ali did not have in Medina, and then they could go fight the Qatar at Uthman. They could then take on the mobs. This is one understanding. Um, another understanding is that uh, they felt that even Mecca is too dangerous because it's close to Medina, that they need to find a neutral place or a third space, if you like, that is safe for them and they can begin uh, negotiations. Uh, whatever is the actual reason, it is explicitly mentioned by Aisha radiallahu anha and Talha and Zubair that the goal was to bring about a reconciliation uh, between the tension rising parties within the Ummah. Because there are people that are very frustrated about the killing of Uthman radiallahu anhu. Now we haven't even begun the discussion of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. That we will discuss next week inshaAllah. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, he is of course a cousin of Uthman. And he is also the most powerful governor at the time. And he has been in Syria for over 20 years and he has complete control. He has an army, he has popularity. And Muawiyah radiallahu an, now this is awkward to say, but he did not give the oath of allegiance to Ali until he said, I will give you the oath as soon as you kill the Qatalat Uthman. That's my condition. I have no problems giving the oath, but my cousin's death needs to be avenged. So that was a major source of tension. So that's happening. We're not going to talk about this week. That'll be inshallah. Uh, uh, next week, inshallah, go over that. So you have one issue over here, and you have other Sahaba who, they don't agree with yani, not giving bay'ah to Ali, but they don't agree with not doing anything. As I said, there's more than one perspective here. And so the notion comes, let's go to a third space, let's go to another place, and that's Basra. And Basra, if you remember, is one of the earliest of the establishments in the time of Umar al-Khattab. And it had now, of course, a good critical mass of Sahaba and good people there. There's also a theory, by the way, that some of the Qatalat Uthman had gone back to Basra. And so uh, Aisha and Talha and Zubayd, they felt that if they went there, they could deal with them directly as well. Again, why would they go to Basra? Allah knows the, the actual reason. These are some theories that are um, given. Nonetheless, the notion came that they're all going to go to um, Basra. Radiallahu uh, anhu ajma'in. And uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, she, uh, as you know, there are special laws of hijab about the mothers of the believers. The mothers of the believers, the, our mothers, they, they can never be seen in public. Even their outer body can never be seen in public. They have to have a special layer of uh, protection. And uh, this is what the Quran calls hijab. This is, uh, I mentioned this many times in this masjid and many places. When we say hijab, we mean the Arabic khimar. Right? Uh, the Arabic khimar, the headscarf, we call it hijab. That's fine, no problem. Just realize what the Quran says khimar, that's the hijab we call. When the Quran says hijab, it means an actual curtain between the mothers of the believers and the everybody else, non-mahrams, right? Obviously their mahadim could enter into the curtain. So Urwa ibn al-Zubair, the grand nephew of Aisha, would lift up their curtain, go back inside and speak to Aisha, then come back out and tell the Sahaba what they needed to know. So Urwa and others would enter the curtain because they're mahram. But everybody who's not mahram, there's an actual curtain between the wives of the Prophet and the uh, other Sahaba. And when they are outside, they are in a special um, haudaj. Uh, what is a haudaj in English? It's like a mini tent on a camel. It's like a, a, a mini encampment, if you like, that they're sitting in that. And so Aisha radiallahu anha, her camel basically was well recognized because it's the only camel that has that special haudaj on it. It has special, uh, you know what, you, you know what I'm talking about here, that mini tent structure, right? Is there even a word in English for it? I don't even know a word in English. I don't think the Americans would have had a word for that type of encampment on a camel's back. But the point being that she's on that special camel, so everybody can see that that is Aisha, meaning that's the camel of Aisha, and she's inside that haudaj, right? So she has a special camel. It's a very, it was a very beautiful camel. It was also decorated because it is Aisha's camel, and it has that haudaj on it. So the the goal was that Aisha radiallahu anha walking and marching, not walking, but meaning riding, and being outside for this cause will generate support for the cause. And this is well understood psychologically. When you have such a high profile personality, then people's support will come. And that's exactly what happened. Probably five, six hundred people left Mecca 
with Talha, Aisha, and Zubair. By the time they got to Basra, Ibn uh, tabari and others say they were 30,000 strong. Do the math. From 600 to 30,000. So they're gaining support and they're gaining momentum for their cause. And the goal is to demonstrate, very much like we have protests or whatnot, to demonstrate to Ali radiallahu an that we need to do this now and we have the critical mass to fight these ghawgha, these, these um, uh, the, the riffraff, the crowd. And we as, so this is very explicit, we as Sunnis believe that it is impossible to even think that Aisha radiallahu anha intended to fight Ali. That never even crossed their minds. And especially Talha and Zubair, they had given their bay'ah to Ali. It is impossible that they would have thought that this is a gathering of an army to fight against Ali. This is not our narrative. It is the narrative of the other group, you understand? But our narrative, come, nobody says this. Nobody from our side. This is not even a valid interpretation. Because it is nonsensical to believe that Ali radiallahu anh and Aisha intended to go to war together. Ibn Taymiyyah writes that uh, Aisha herself never fought, nor even did she have the niyyah of fighting when she left Mecca. She didn't even come in her mind. Rather... She felt that in order to bring about some type of reconciliation, her presence would benefit the believers. But later on, this is Ibn Taymiyyah, but later on she realized that if she had remained and not done that, it would have been better. And every time she recalled the incident of the camel, she would cry until her khimar, her scarf, would become wet. And the same applies for the rest of the Sahaba, Talha and Zubair and Ali. None of them intended for the day of the camel to become a battle. But fighting broke out in the ranks without their choice. And this is the position of a Dhahabi and Ibn Kathir. And I mean basically every Sunni scholar. The only difference of opinion is from the other side. And frankly we're not interested in their narrative. Especially at this level of our uh, lecture. So Aisha radiallahu anha. She begins to march in the Hawdaj. And slowly but surely as they're going through. Everybody hears of the cause. More and more people join. We need the vengeance for the dam of Uthman. We want to bring about the killers of Uthman and call them to justice. Now there's an interesting hadith uh, uh, mentioned here. It is said that when Aisha was outside of Basra and she, it was the, the, the night and the caravan was proceeding, uh, they passed by an oasis and uh, they could hear the barking of dogs. So Aisha said, what oasis is this? So she was told it is the oasis of Hawab, Hawab, outside of Basra. So Aisha said, I feel that our mission will not succeed. She had a premonition, I feel that our mission will not succeed. They said, no, no, you will go to Basra and the Muslims will be united under you. She said, no, I remember one day the Prophet wasallam said to me, or said to us, all of us were sitting there, his wives, said, what shall be the state of one of you? Ihdakunna, one of you wives, yani what is going to be your state when the dogs of Hawab will be barking at them? Meaning, it's not a positive thing that 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 you you should that that state is not a positive thing. What is going to be your affairs when the dogs of Hawab will be barking at them? And this hadith uh, is great as Sahih by Al Albani and others, um, and uh, Imam Al Dhahabi and others say there is no question that Aisha deeply regretted her decision to depart for Basra and her participation in the battle of Jamal, and she never assumed that the matter would reach what it reached. So this is again very clear from our perspective. In any case, they reached Basra in Rabi' al-Awwal of 36 AH. So it's around four months after the death of Uthman radiallahu anhu. So for literally after the Bay'ah of Ali, within a few months now, this battle of Jamal uh, takes place. And they reach Basra and they are, according to Al-Tabari, 30,000 strong. And there are other reports that say other figures, as you know, who's doing statistics and numbering at this time. But a, 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 an army too large to count. Now the governor of Basra panicked because he sees 30,000 armed men. 
and he has no clue what's going on. Like, why are you doing this? What's going on? The governor of Basra panicked, and he sent out a uh, expeditionary skirmishing uh, party. Um, the issue got tense between them, and some swords were drawn and some lives were lost, but it wasn't an all-out war yet. This is basically the skirmishing party that came out. Uh, they lost some lives, and uh, Aisha and others managed to march into Basra, and it was unclear now who is in control. Is it the governor of Basra, who is loyal to Ali, or is it Aisha and their 30,000 um, people? So the governor of Basra says, I'm not doing anything till Ali himself comes. Basically, he wanted to bring Ali directly and say, you deal with this, I don't know what to do. So he insists that Ali radiallahu anhu come down to uh, Basra and deal with the situation. And so so uh, Ali radiallahu an, uh, he was diverted from dealing with Muawiyah and he goes to Basra. He was thinking about dealing with Muawiyah because Muawiyah, uh, we're going to talk about him next week and, and what is the reality. And so Ali radiallahu an then uh, went to um, Basra. Now he already had a force with him uh, and that force was initially intended for Muawiyah. But now he's marching up to deal with this uh, issue in Basra. And when he gets to Basra, or not actually the city, when he's outside of Basra by a day or so, he sends an envoy, an emissary, uh, very famous, he's not a Sahabi, he's a Tabi'i, by the name of Al-Qa'qa ibn uh, Amr. And Al-Qa'qa was one of the main commanders of Qadisiyah, uh, and he was one of the famous commanders who had done many of the conquests and the victories, a very noble, respected uh, person. And he sends Al-Qa'qa to negotiate and he enters in upon Aisha. Obviously, whenever I say enters upon Aisha, I mean behind the Hawdaj or the hijab. No Sahabi is allowed to see Aisha, even her outer body, even in the hijab. You cannot. That's our Sharia. All the mothers of the believers, except for the um, Maharim. So uh, he speaks. Uh, you can speak, by the way. You can speak with the mothers of believers, as Allah says in the Quran uh, that uh, Wa idha mata'an. When you ask them for anything, ask them from behind a curtain. So they, the Sahaba are speaking to Aisha radiallahu anha, but from behind a actual curtain. So uh, Al Qa'qa enters it upon Aisha and says that, Ya Ummah, oh my mother, you know, what is the matter? Why have you come all the way here? And Aisha says, We have come to seek revenge for the death of Uthman. This is our goal. We have come to seek revenge. This is our demand. That's why we have all of these people here. We demand that we, you take care of the Qatalat of Uthman and that we want to bring about reconciliation. So Aisha felt that if her demands were met, that uh, she could deal with uh, even Muawiyah radiallahu anhu would be then unified, right? So she's becoming a third party in order to bring about a sulh between everybody. And she feels because of her status and persona, that, and that was what she was told as well. Talha and Zubair said the same thing, that you know, if you just go there and the people see you, everybody will respect you. Can I remember, by the way, Aisha and all of the mothers of the believers have lived completely apolitical lives, right? And when a person lives completely apolitical, then becomes into politics, generally speaking, they have a cleaner slate and people look up to them as it is. What do you think of Aisha and she is our mother? And she is the beloved of the Prophet ﷺ. How much respect would she have? So this was the point that, look, you know, for, for 35 years, you know, you have been living a, a, a life of ibadah and zuhd and cut off. Now people will see you. It will remind them. It will bring back your st status, your haiba, your, your, your maqam. It will bring back the people. That was the goal that Aisha had to bring about sulh between all of these um, parties. So... Uh, Qa'a Qa, uh, uh, then uh, demanded to see Talha and Zubair. They also came. So Talha, Zubair, Aisha, and Qa'a Qa, they're all over there discussing. And for three days, the emissary goes back and forth with the demands back and forth, whatnot. And finally, a compromise is actually reached. After three days of negotiations, a compromise is reached. And um, in, in, essentially, what it, what it demanded was that Ali radiallahu an. Uh, get rid of all of the mobs and the crowds from around Medina and to expel from his ranks anybody who was known to have sympathized with the protesters. Right Now realize this is a very large amount of people and the demand was anybody who, from that camp because there were many who were in the camp of Ali then that they were of those who protested against Uthman. And one of the conditions was that cut off all relations with that entire thousands of people. 
and they actually even had names specifically. This person, this person was known to be a protester, and now he's a supporter of yours, and he's in your army. We don't want any of them. That was one of the conditions. And then the other condition was that now you have to find the actual killers, do the investigation, find who they are, and then uh, punish them. So uh, basically, the uh, conditions were agreed upon within three days. Back and forth. Ali radiallahu an is a day's away outside of Basra, basically half a day outside of Basra, and Aisha is inside of inside of Basra. So al qaqa between the two of them finally comes to this uh, agreement, and Alhamdulillah, it seemed to be very positive now. And Ibn Kathir writes from his tariq, uh, Ibn Kathir is one of our most famous historians, and he's written one of the most definitive histories, obviously from the Sunni perspective, uh, Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya. This is a 10 volume or 8 volume book, massive book, and this is the most comprehensive and analytical medieval history ever written. And it's one of the, the greatest books of history of our tradition. Straight from that book he writes, Ibn Kathir writes, so on that night, meaning on the third night, both camps went to their bed completely satisfied with the outcome and happy that reconciliation had been reached. So everything appears now to have been worked. But the killers of Uthman and the mobs had the worst night and they plotted a plan and they agreed to start a fitna. So the same people that had basically instigated the uh, the, the killing of Uthman decided that this is not heading in the direction that they want it to head. And so they agreed to commit uh, a very evil, heinous tactic, which is well known, and every book of history mentions this, that in the middle of the night, when both camps were asleep, around 2,000 of these mobs, 2,000 of the same groups that had been sympathetic to, to the killers of Uthman, they split up, 1,000 here, 1,000 there, and they launched a surprise attack on each one of them, on each of the two groups. And they began to claim that they are from the other group. They began to claim that they are from the other group. And this is killing in literally in the middle of the night in cold blood. So you can imagine what the response would have been. Each side assumed that the other side had betrayed. Each side, especially the soldiers and the commanders on the ground, they just assumed that this is a betrayal of the highest magnitude. And therefore, immediately they came to arms and a battle ensued that lasted for most of that day. That lasted for most of that day and much blood was shed. In fact, so much blood was shed that we don't even have a actual number of how many people uh, died and uh, Al-Hassan ibn Ali, the son of Ali, Al-Hassan ibn Ali, the grandson of the Prophet he has, we have an authentic report from him, he said that I, I checked on my father to make sure he was safe when the battle was at its peak, this is the day of Jamal, I checked on my father and I found him basically almost in tears, crying and he is saying, Ya Hassan, how I wish I had died 20 years before this day, like how can this be happening now? We have Aisha on one side and me on the uh, other side. And this was the very first actual civil war in Islam. The very first time where you had Muslims on both sides killing Muslims. And in this chaos, we don't even know how many people died. al tabari estimates Asharatu Alaf. 10,000 people. 10,000 dead. That is, I mean, just... I mean, our Eid is 5,000, double that. Just imagine 10,000 dead in one day of battle because of the chaos, because of the anger, because all of this. And uh, subhanAllah, two of the deaths were so tragic that they eclipsed all 10,000. And of course, these are the two deaths of the two greatest Sahaba alive, and that is Talha and Zubair. Talha and Zubair, they both met their ends on this day. As for Talha, uh, and the both of them were in their 70s uh, or, or late 60s. Talha was 70 something and Zubair was 60 something. Literally, they're, they're not old men now. But as for Talha, he was on his horse running through the battlefield, telling them to sh uh, sheathe your sword, stop fighting. Like he's trying to stop them because clearly something is wrong. And he's telling them to stop fighting. And out of nowhere, an arrow came 
and it uh, went so deep into his thigh that it slashed open one of the main arteries of his thigh and it bled so profusely that he died of bleeding. The, the blood was, the, the, the wound was so deep that he basically died of um, uh, bleeding. And um, the other side claims that Marwan ibn al-Hakam was the one who fired the arrow. Marwan al-Hakam, of course, is eventually going to become the Khalifa after Yazid and the Hanis and Muawiyah. Marwan becomes the Khalifa, right? The other side claims Marwan was the one who, uh, who um, did this. Um, but, uh, but that doesn't make any sense. And, and Allah knows. Ibn Kathir says that people say this, but this is not true. We don't know who killed him. It was just an arrow that was shot and it came out. And uh, when Ali radiallahu anh, eventually uh, found the body of Talha, he held it up with his own hands and he wiped uh, the dust from the face of Talha. And he said to Allah, I complain of my situation, how I wish I had died before this day. Like, how can I see this, you know, happening in front of my um, eyes? And uh, as for a Zubair, as for a Zubair, uh, reports differ. There is one report that is somewhat controversial, but I will say it anyway, and it's found in many Sunni books, so, so I'll say it anyway. Um, it is said that Ali sent Zubair a message on this day that don't you remember one day the Prophet predicted that you would be fighting me? Now, Zubair and Ali are cousins, distant cousins. They're all from the the, the Banu Hashim, the, the Quraysh, right? So Zubair and Ali, they knew each other from back in the day and they were obviously very close as well. So uh, Ali said to him, radiallahu anh, don't you remember that one day the Prophet said to you that you would be fighting me and you would be in the wrong? You would be fighting me and you wouldn't be in the wrong? And as Zubair allegedly said, I say allegedly because the hadith scholars differ, is it authentic or not? It is found in our tradition. It's a Sunni hadith. Whether it's authentic or not is the question. Some, some ulama say it's da'if, some say it's hasan. It's, it's basically in that gray area. Um, so uh, when Zubair got this message, he said, I have only remembered this hadith right now. Like meaning completely I forgot about this until right now you reminded me. And so Zubair put his sword back and left the battlefield. He did not participate. Now the other version says that uh, he simply decided not to participate anyway and he left. Both versions say Zubayr turned his back and walked away from the battlefield. Right? The one version says he turned away because of the hadith. The other version says he turned away because he didn't want to kill other Muslims. Both versions say Zubayr did not participate. Even Talha did not participate. He was running around on his horse telling them to stop and to calm down. These Sahaba are too big to fight themselves against other Muslims. They did not do that. So Zubayr radiallahu anh did not participate. However, one of the senior most of the rabble rousers and of the Qatal of Uthman, the sympathizers. And uh, his name is well known and it's something that uh, any, I mean, we don't know him, most of you have never heard of it, but he is well known that he was of those who was always instigating. He saw Zubair walk out. So he made it his goal that I'm going to kill Zubair ibn Awam. So he followed Zubair. And that night when Zubair was praying to Hajjud, in that night, not in the battlefield, that night when Zubair was praying to Hajjud, he surprised it surprised him and executed him, killed him as he was praying uh, tahajjud. Uh, and so uh, Zubair radiallahu anh also died a shaheed on the night of the day of the camel. Right? Talha on the day of the day of the camel. Zubair the same night from the same people. So that's why it's essentially the same battle that brought his death. Right? He was there. One of the other side saw him leave and he goes, I'm not going to let this guy go. He's, he's going to be, everybody knows Zubair. So they followed him and they killed. Now, as for Zubair ibn Awam, there are authentic ahadith in Sahih Bukhari and others. Authentic ahadith that... Uh, that Bashir Qatalat ibn Safiya bin Nar give glad tidings. It's used sarcastically in the hadith and the Quran sometimes. Bashir is sometimes used as a somewhat of a sarcastic thing. To the one who kills the son of Safiya, right? With the fire of hell. Kill the, uh, uh, give glad tidings to the one who kills the son of Safiya with the uh, fire of hell. So when Ali heard of this, that 
Zubair has been killed, he said, go give glad tidings to the killer that he shall be in Jahannam. Go give glad tidings to the killer that the one who killed him will be in uh, Jahannam. So Ali radiallahu anhu managed the, to basically quell the battle and he announced uh, amongst his troops that no more killing. Anybody who flees shall be unharmed. Anybody who does not fight shall be unharmed. Anybody who is in a house shall be unharmed. Anybody who walks without weapons shall be unharmed. Meaning, don't kill anybody unless they are attacking you. Everybody else should be safe. And he gathered up all of the ghanima, the booty that had been captured by his troops, and he put it in the masjid. And he said, whoever it belongs to, come and take it. Meaning, his troops did not get the ghanima. Because this was not a jihad. In the eyes of Ali ibn radiallahu anh, it was not a jihad. It was not a legitimate jihad. So any battle uh, war booty that had been acquired, he put it in the masjid for display. And he goes, whoever is the rightful owner or the waratha, the inheritors, they should go and pick their stuff up and take it back. And as for uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, as for Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, she was given the utmost honor by Ali radiallahu anh. And uh, he uh, visited her. It is said that he visited her uh, in the Hawdaj. And uh, he said to her, uh, may Allah forgive you. Uh, and her reply was, and may Allah forgive you as well. I only intended sulh. Meaning, I did not intend all that this happened, right? So, no doubt, there are obviously, I mean, we have talked about this previously. Uh, there's no doubt that the seerah indicates that Aisha and Ali radiallahu anhum, there was some very trivial tensions between them from a number of incidents. And this is common between uh, many people and especially in this nature but there's no hatred or animosity and now that this this battle has finished so uh, Ali makes a dua for her that may Allah forgive you and she replies may Allah forgive you as well that I only intended uh, a sulh now we also have a very interesting hadith in the uh, Mustadrak of Al-Hakim we have a very interesting hadith in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim uh, which is considered authentic by Al-Hakim and Al-Dhahabi and others and it is that one day the Prophet was sitting, Ali was sitting in the house of Aisha, and she was behind the veil, and the Prophet was there. And uh, the Prophet said to Ali that, said to Ali that, uh, one, that uh, there shall be an amr, a matter between the two of you. There shall be some tension, something that happens between uh, the two of you, between you and her. And he pointed towards the curtain and there was Aisha behind that. And Ali radiallahu anhu said, if that ever happens, then I am the worst of the two. I am the, I'm the worst of the two. How could I have a, a tension or a fight with, with, how could anything happen between me and her? I'm the, the worst of the two. And the Prophet said, no, la. But when that happens, فَرُدَّهَا إِلَى مَأْمَنِهَا Take her back to her place of safety. This hadith is in Al Hakim's Mustadrak, our book. And uh, this is exactly what Ali radiallahu anhu did. That again, what does the hadith say? That a time will come when there shall be some type of matter, tension. The, the hadith says Amr. And Amr, as the Arabs know, it basically means something of substance. And typically it's used in a negative sense, right? There's going to be. A dispute or something like this, we should say. And I, uh, Ali said, if that ever happens, I'm the worst. That I'm the lesser of the two. And the Prophet said, no, I'm not saying that. But when it does happen, then I ask you to return her to her place of safety, which is her house and her and Medina. So when the battle uh, basically finished, uh, Ali radiallahu anh, uh, basically uh, asked her to, uh, or gave the largest house of Basra, he vacated it and he gave it to Aisha and her entourage and he made sure that she was well taken care of and he visited her for the few days that she was in Basra and uh, while he was in those days in Basra, uh, he was told that some people are saying bad things of Aisha, that she caused this, she did this and all the blame is on her. So he gave the hukum, the command that anybody who speaks ill of Aisha should be lashed 100 times. Anybody who speaks ill of Aisha should be 
lashed. So the punishment was actually carried out on a number of people uh, that uh, who were basically blaming everything on, not saying, now what were they saying, the astaghfirullah, they weren't saying astaghfirullah, the slander, that's, that's not even possible for any Muslim to say. They were basically uh, saying that this is all her fault and she caused it all and if she had not, so they're basically putting the blame on her. And Ali radiallahu anh said, whoever disrespects Aisha should be lashed 100 times, so that basically was implemented in the city of Basra. Then he gathered an entourage to send her back, whoever would be with her, and he uh, commanded 40 of the noble ladies of Basra. So he chose 40 of the noble families, their daughters or wives or whatever, to be her entourage, and then men to basically protect them. So obviously that there's safety, there's no shubha, there's nobody thinking bad that she's going uh, alone with strange men, because Talha and Zubair have been killed. Right? And many of her party have been killed. Uh, so there was more casualties on Aisha's side because Ali has the prepared army. Right, There's more casualties and especially the senior members of Aisha's entourage are all gone now. Especially Talha and Zubay. They're now gone. So who's going to bring her back? So he chose 40 of the noble ladies of Basra to basically be her, basically, uh, um, just a protective... You know, just so that nobody says anything bad or anything. And then, of course, you have the the warriors and the people that are going to guard this entourage. And he appointed the brother of Aisha, and that is Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. He appointed the brother of Aisha to be the leader of the caravan. So that's her mahram in the caravan. And he then uh, commanded that they go back to Medina. And uh, it is reported that before she left um, Basra, she... Uh, said to the people that, oh people, do not backbite one another, meaning stop saying anything bad about any other Muslim. Do not backbite one another for whatever kalam, whatever speech is between Ali and myself is the speech that happens between a woman and her in-laws. And he is of the Salihin. And this is the Sunni perspective on the whole issue, which is the middle path, by the way. A lot of modern Sunni historians, they try to sugarcoat and they want to say there was nothing. And to me, it is very obvious that there were some tensions between the two. And so what if they were? So what? It is human nature to have these types of tensions. And look at the fiqh of Aisha. Look at her maturity. That she says, you know, every family has tensions with the in-laws. This is human nature. And Ali is my in-law, isn't he? Right? He's the brother-in-law almost. He's, a, so he's like basically a type of in-law to me. And so yes, we've had issues just like everybody has with the in-laws. But he is of the salihin. I'm not doubting his iman. I'm not doubting his... He's not astaghfirullah a bad person. He is of the uh, salihin. And when this reached Ali radiallahu an, uh, he said, and this is well known, mutawatir from Ali. This statement is mutawatir. He said... Uh, صدقت, she has spoken the truth فَوَاللَّهِ I swear by Allah إِنَّهَا لَزَوْجَةُ نَبِيِّكُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ The woman here, this lady, she is the wife of your Prophet in this dunya and in the akhirah. How can you say anything bad about her? Right? She has spoken the truth that look, anything that happened between us is just minor tension. It wasn't meant to be anything more than this. It's just kalam that happens between in-laws all the time. We're not doubting each other's iman or character or anything. And this is the, as I said, the, the unanimously agreed upon uh, Sunni narrative. And in fact, in some books of history it is mentioned that he accompanied the caravan outside the city and then he commanded Hassan and Hussein to walk the rest of the day with the caravan as an honor to the caravan. That this has Aisha in it. And then of course they came back and the caravan continued on to uh, Medina. And it is narrated in Ibn Abi Shaib and many other books of hadith. And Ibn Taymiyyah mentions this narration. I mentioned that whenever Aisha used to talk about the battle of the camel. It is called of course I forgot to mention the most obvious thing. Why is it called the battle of the camel? Because Aisha's camel was one of the most prominent icons of the whole battle. right? Aisha's camel was a central piece and people were protecting it and people were, so that's like in the center of the of the of the battlefield in fact the camel itself was injured because of an arrow that came in so that's very dangerous imagine when Allah protected our mother but just imagine a cam uh, the, the the camel itself is injured because an arrow is coming so our mother's on that camel um, but 
uh, it was called the Battle of the Camel because of the prominence of Aisha's camel, because of the central role. Typically, you don't find a woman's camel on the battlefield, do you? You don't find the Hodaj. So because it was there, it's called the Battle of the um, Camel. And any time Aisha remembered the Battle of the Camel and talked about it, she would begin to cry uh, until her khimar would become wet with her tears. And she regretted uh, doing this because it unintentionally led to what it led to. It was not in the knee of anybody, but uh, obviously, uh, if that had not happened, if she had not gone, then that would not have developed into this uh, reality. Um, unfortunately, this was the first of a much worse battle that's going to take place. This was the first of two civil wars. This one was fully unintentional. The same cannot be said so easily of the second one. The second one is a little bit more complicated. And clearly, both sides were armed to fight. And what exactly happened and how and what not, we'll talk about, inshallah, next weekend, next Wednesday. But uh, this battle is a bit easier to discuss because we can clearly say, and this, as I said, is the clear narrative, neither side actually wanted a physical compact with the other. Aisha radiallahu anha felt that her presence and her rallying call was like a mass protest and it would bring about a tipping point that Ali would understand radiallahu that we have to do this and in fact it did work to a certain extent. It did work in that Ali radiallahu anha agreed to these demands and he goes, okay, we're going to get rid of all of these people and the next order of duty will be to hunt down the killers of Uthman. But now obviously this massacre with 10,000 people, it made it even more tense in the Muslim world at the time. And unfortunately this led to the, great, the greatest disaster of the first uh, 40 years of Islam. And that is the battle of Safin between Muawiyah radiallahu an and Ali radiallahu an. Uh, and that will be inshallah next um, Wednesday. One final point, obviously the other side, non-Sunni side, uh, is extremely clear in its verdict on Aisha radiallahu anha and Talha and Zubair. And from their perspective, this makes these three in particular figures that are maybe even outside the fold of Islam. And for us to accuse Aisha of this is just as worse of a blasphemy as what they are doing. So for us, we are very clear to accuse Aisha radiallahu anha in particular of uh, something. I mean, this is really, anybody who says this or believes this, we have to doubt this person's iman. Because Aisha is too high of a maqam. And from our perspective, everybody who participated, especially in the Battle of the Camel, there is no question, nobody wanted blood. It was not even the intended goal. Obviously, from their side, from their side, you should just know it. It was planned from day one. The battle of the camel was planned as a battle. And the three of them that we respect, from their perspective, they wanted to engage and even kill Ali. This is their perspective. And this is ludicrous. I mean, Talha and Zubair, their bay'ah was to Ali. How, how, I mean, it's impossible. They did not say, we no longer give bay'ah to Ali. They didn't break their bay'ah. They didn't join Muawiyah. They didn't, they're simply saying, we disagree with the delay and we want to have Qatar of Uthman taken care of right now. And in any case, inshallah, we come to the end of the battle of the Jamal. Inshallah, next Wednesday, we will do the battle of uh, Sifin, inshallah. Any quick questions that I'm going to try to evade as much as possible and just gloss over because it's best not to go too deep. But Bismillah. This is one of these far-fetched theories that doesn't seem to make any sense whatsoever. Uthman radiallahu and the actual siege lasted between 20 to 25 days. Okay? And it only got extremely bad maybe the last week when they cut off food and water from him. 
So from Medina to Damascus, minimum two weeks travel. So you do the math. No, no, no. So the complaints are going on for years, but the mobs gathered after Hajj somewhat spontaneously, right? So the assumption that Muawiyah radiallahu anh knew this and he has an army coming to attack, it's one of these far-fetched theories that doesn't have any legitimate basis to it. Okay. Inshallah, we'll pause here, inshallah, then resume next Wednesday. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.